Ah, the preparations for a long-distance solo sail. Even Sir Francis Chichester had his complaints. I remember his irritation. The endless lists, the interruptions, the difficulty sourcing parts. Even for mortals, it's an issue. These jack lines of mine are four years old, so time for some new ones. This is an expensive West Marine product, but at least it's trustworthy. It seems to have a high breaking strength and the color is right. It's just webbing. You tighten it up as much as you can, it, sh it shrinks some in the sun. And whenever I go forward offshore alone, I clip in with my harness to the jack line. Oh look, here's Oliver McCann. Well, I'm glad you came along because I would have had to do this stuff on my home sewing machine. And what did you find, Oliver, just at, a, at an immediate inspection? Well, the, uh, these, these have a sacrificial cover that's exposed to the sun 24-7 right. when it's rolled up. And the stitching will eventually fail after six or seven years. And we just figured out this is about six years old, so you're right on schedule. Right. And uh, so it's timely. They'll have a, it Good. probably wouldn't have catastrophically failed even if the stitching had come down here and there, but right. if the whole thing does really rip, then, you can, then you've got a lot of... It's a lot of, uh, of sewing all to do. It does. I want to show you something else, uh, if I can... So this has been developing. What is that? Is that significant, Oliver? Yeah, we'll repair that. Um, what happens is the when the sail is rolled up there, the, the sail is covered on both sides with a UV protective material right ahead, but you can't put it around the luff tape that goes into the foil groove. Oh. So the sun hits that, and that's what ha what's happened over the years as well. I see. Um, that would be an easy fix on board. You could just take it, cut it down if you had to, and melt it with a lighter or a hot knife. Good. Um, but what we'll probably do is put a, a very thin sleeve around that. A UV Dacron sleeve, so it'll hold it. It'll be very thin, so it won't, won't affect that, the. Room. That's great. Otherwise, though, it's. In, I, I think you'll find when you get it in the loft that it's in fairly good shape. Yeah, I can just see that from folding it up. Right. The material is still nice and crisp. Yeah. The one essential idea of single-handed sailing is that if something breaks, you're the one who has to fix it, and that means every tool in the kit. I like to keep uh, screwdrivers and pliers and such in these roll-up canvas bags. It just makes them easy to put away and pull out. Sleeping, which is optional for single-handers, is best done constrained in a narrow bunk. and. So when on port tack, which makes this the lowest side, a simple hatchboard works. On the other side, I devised a, an insert to go behind the cabin table to keep me from falling out of my bunk. It also serves the purpose of strengthening a pedestal table, which is by its nature not very secure in a seaway when you lunge against it. Books, drinks, and dinner also go flying, and that's why this caddy comes in quite handy. This marvelous piece of fine furniture made of plywood and drywall screws with a cushion stolen from the forepeak and a backrest, which used to be the navigator's cushion, is designed to keep me in one place while operating a laptop for navigation. I had a friend, a distinguished oncologist, who used to make his own sandals. He and his wife would visit tanneries to pick just the right leather, and I inherited some from him after he died. Dr. John was no hippie, so I know that he would approve of repurposing his personal footwear supplies as anti-chafing gear for the whisker pole. It's carbon fiber and tends to rub against the stays under some conditions.
Every sailor prepares for gales and heavy weather his own way. And I think the solution these days is a Jordan series drogue. It's a very long line, several hundred feet of heavy nylon, interspersed with more than 100 individual cones designed to grip the water as it's deployed off the stern of the vessel. The idea is to lower the sails or run before the gale, and the long drogue behind you will keep the boat pointed downwind and not broach. The drogue is attached to the back of the boat with this 50-foot long bridle, and to the end of it is attached a weight, in this case uh, about 20 pounds of chain. I'm not sure the shackle will fit. Well, it does. When you're ready to set the drogue, uh, you throw the weight over the transom and it pays out and slows your speed from what can be eight or ten knots to one or two knots. I installed a new Cape Horn Integral self-steering system for this voyage. I'll put a link to that in the description. It sets simply by pulling its lines tight. This is the antenna, which uh, is important uh, for satellite communication. I can get a good signal down below at the navigation station. And because I don't have a dodger, I, I just prefer not to have a dodger, I've had to devise some sun protection plans, and this works really well. In some cases, when it's raining or the sun is stupefyingly bright in the tropical regions, this insert extends the, the companionway hatch, and over it I can pull my hatch sun cover and attach it there. Uh, actually, I forgot to put the other piece of Velcro on. There we go. So the Velcro holds it in place. And believe it or not, there are conditions when the sun is so strong and low in the sky that this sort of a rig is necessary to keep from being blinded whilst eating dinner. The hatchboard goes in easily from that side. I have added on the other side a grab holder of webbing so that I can manipulate it because in heavy weather the hatch is inside. But nothing keeps it closed. A latch is uh, inconvenient. So I use hatch sticks, which are attached by Velcro to the inside of the companionway, so that if, when riding through the drogue, a wave were to overwhelm the boat from behind, it couldn't push open the hatch. And of course, you got to eat. I know, I know. 90 days worth of food for one guy seems kind of excessive. And yet it is a round trip voyage of perhaps 6,000 miles and two months at sea or more. And extra food at sea is always a good idea. Here's where single handing pays off. There's lots of room. That's line storage, and here in the V-berth, with all the cushions taken home, there's plenty of room for all my emergency hardware designed to be able to fix anything that can possibly break. Ho, ho. You can't have too much stuff. I also bring extra lumber, drywall screws to fix potentially a hull breach or a lost hatch or anything you can think up in the dead of night whilst planning. It's very useful to have uh, an attractive spouse who tolerates personal organization, sometimes. Uh, this is the only time. B for breakfast. They're all, in, they're all in plastic bags, the bees, I think. Yes, the bees are all in the plastic bags. I found it good to keep the food in these buckets. It doesn't get wet up there. 
and it gives me entertainment digging through the breakfast pile looking for the lunch or dinner pile. Clothes, you got to have them too. And you need clothes for very hot weather and clothes for freezing cold Southern California weather, by which I mean 59 degrees. Let's get some air. I've had four or five test sales of my new Cape Horn gear. Testing is very important, only in about 10 or 15 knots though, meaning that I go down there and study the organization and the leads of the lines in an attempt to anticipate any possible chafing. I don't see any. We'll see. Navigation. Ah, yes. My least favorite part is the electronics. Here's the way my system works. That's a satellite telephone, which is hooked up to the antenna we saw in the cockpit for good reception indoors. The telephone is hooked up to a laptop. The laptop is hooked up to a hockey puck GPS. And this time I have the luxury of a mouse. I download weather files GRIBs and surface analysis charts using UU Plus. And this is a, a GRIB chart of the voyage planned. And interestingly, if we look here tomorrow, the weather looks pretty good. Only about 15 knots on our route. Let's see. I just got. 65.9 gallons of diesel fuel. I wonder what that cost. That's six dollars and eleven cents a gallon. Three hundred and thirty-one dollars. Hmm. Okay. Fair enough. So that is about twenty gallons in these jugs up here. And I finally broke down and installed a fuel gauge. I never really believed in the things. So that I now have the pleasure of seeing a fuel gauge read full. But of course, not knowing what that means. And when it reads empty, how many gallons of diesel do you have left? You really don't know that either, so you have to take it apart and measure with a stick. Anyhow, I have joined the ranks of fuel gauge owners despite aviation training that says you'll die if you ever trust them. Well, everything looks good. We leave tomorrow. I've done everything I could. Everything's in the hands now of, well, me.